Hi there. Uh, in this section of videos, I'm going to be talking to you all about potential dividers and how we can use them in sensing circuits. So let's get started. Now, before we begin, there are a couple of key concepts that you need to remember in order to make sense of this. The first is Ohm's law, V is equal to I times R. So always keep this in your head that it's so long as we know the current through something and the voltage across it, we can always calculate its resistance, and vice versa. If we can know two of those things, we can always work out the other one. The second one we need to know is the idea of Kirchhoff's first law. So Kirchhoff's first law tells us what happens to uh, current at a junction. So if you imagine that I have a wire coming along here with three amps running through it, if I have a choice, if my, if my electrons can choose to go down two different wires, then what I can say is that the total of the currents through those following wires must equal the total current going in. Similarly, if there are no nodes, no joins in my circuit, I can say that the current is the same everywhere along it. Second thing to say is that around any closed loop in a circuit, the sum of all the EMFs, and remember EMFs are voltages from batteries or power supplies, that is always equal to the sum of the voltage of the voltages across the components. So let's say I have a six volt battery here. Then I can pick any loop I like. So let's just pick a loop that goes through like that. In that case, I can say that my EMF is six. So I can say six is equal to, and if I call this X and Y, six must be equal to the voltage in X plus the voltage in Y. Now, if these were identical resistors, then I would say that is equal to 3 plus 3. So we just have 3 volts. If they were different resistors, they could have different values. If I pick a different loop and go through this way, then again I can say that 6 is equal to, now there's only one thing, so if I call this Z, that must be equal to the potential through Z. There's actually one more thing that I'm going to just talk about very quickly, just to make sure you're really comfortable with it, and that is there's a third loop that goes like this. Now the interesting thing about that loop is that there are no potential, there are no EMFs, there's no batteries or power supplies, so I can say zero is equal to, and the first thing I went through was Z, but then I went through Y then X backwards. I went in the opposite direction to the way that the current was going. See how all my other loops go through it from left to right? The purple loop goes through right to left. So I can say that will then be negative Y and it will be negative X. So that becomes, if I rearrange it and take these negative things onto the other side of the equation, I can say Y plus X is equal to Z. In other words, the potential through Z is equal to the potential between X and Y. Now all these things are going to be really important for understanding what we're doing today. So this is a simple potential divider circuit um, and to understand it, it's it's a pretty nice but, sim but elegant circuit. So what we have is a voltage going in and we have two resistors. Now what can we use from Kirchhoff's laws to find these things? Well, what can we do with this? Well, if you think about it, I've got a couple of loops. And there's one loop in particular that is very interesting to me, and that is this loop here. If you look at that loop here, I can say, again, using K2, that the sum of the EMFs around that loop is the sum of the voltages out in that loop. Now the way I drew it, um, I went against the direction of current because my current is going down that way. So I can say that zero, which is my EMFs, that is equal to V out plus negative R2 because R2 is going against the direction. That loop goes against the direction of R2. In other words, I can say V out is equal to the voltage across resistor 2. Why is that important? Well, what it means is by changing these two resistors, by making them different values of resistance, I can actually control a V out. So I get a V out that depends on these 
two resistors, which is pretty cool. Now there is an equation for this. I'm going to show you how we get the equation because it's quite interesting. If we think about Kirchhoff's first law, so thinking about K1, what I can say is that my current through here, going through that loop, um, what we always do in these types of circuit is we make sure that any resistance through the output is massive, so nearly infinite. So it might be in the ten hundreds of mega ohms range. Now, if that's the case, I can basically say that from the current's perspective, that's not there. So what I can then say is that the current through resistor 1 is equal to the current through resistor 2, which is equal to the current through my battery or power supply, because there's only one loop. That's a little subtle point. If you're not too sure about what I mean by that, do come and speak to me in the lesson and I'll fill you in on it. Now, can I work out what that current is? Well, it turns out I can, because again, if we're assuming that no current goes down here, then I can treat these two resistors as though they are in series. So I can say that this is roughly equal to just a simple circuit like that. I'm just ignoring the output for now. So what I can say is that the current in the battery is equal to the voltage in the battery, which is V in, divided by R1 plus R2. How does that help us? Well, if I know what R2 is, then I can use the equation V is equal to I times R. I now know what I is, because I've just found it here, and I already had R. So I can say that the voltage across R2 which, remember from my previous slide up here, V out is the same as R2. So that is V out. And that is equal to V in multiplied by R2 over R1 plus R2. Now, there are a couple of things that if you're really following this, you might go, oh, I'm a bit confused about that. For instance, um, where I've talked about saying no current goes through my output. If you're happy with it, don't worry, just move on. Um, but if you're thinking there's a little bit of a niggle there, just come and talk to me because there's a little bit here that goes a bit beyond IGCSE um, to make all this work neatly. But this general equation here that I've just put in a, bo a red box around, that tells us what the voltage across a potential divider always is. Now, here's the cool bit. I've just worked out that V out is equal to V in multiplied by R out or R2 over R1 plus R out. I'm going to call R2 R out just to make it really clear that it's the uh, one that I'm measuring my output voltage from. Okay. So what happens if I change the resistance of these? Well, let's just imagine. Let's make R2 bigger. If R out, or R2, gets bigger, then both the top and the bottom of this equation is going to get bigger. However, I mult this, side, this top bit is by itself. So what happens is, as R out increases, V out also increases. Another way of thinking about a potential divider, by the way, is we could do it by ratios. So we could say uh, V1 over V2. So this would be V1 here. V1 over V2 is equal to R1 over R2. And you can see then there quite nicely. If I increase R1, V1 will increase. If I increase V2, V2 will increase. So in other words, if the resistance of this resistor goes up, this voltage goes up. And this is where sensing circuits become really important. Okay, so now we're going to think about how we can use potential dividers in sensing circuits. So there are two, there are two components that we need to think about here. This component is called a thermistor. And you'll experiment with them in class. 
But the basic idea of a thermistor is that its resistance changes with temperature. When it's very, very cold, it has a high resistance. And as its temperature increases, its resistance drops. This is quite unusual. Most devices, as they get hotter, their resistance goes up. But a thermistor does the opposite. Another device you're going to be looking at is a light-dependent resistor. Now, what this does is it senses light levels. And again, it has a similar curve to a thermistor. What happens is, as light levels go up, the resistance of it drops. So it kind of has a curve like that as well. Why is this important? Well, um, we can use these circuits in a sensing circuit like this. So let's just think about what will happen here. I have a 12 volt battery and I have a point A and B here. What will happen to this thermistor when it's cold? So when the thermistor is cold, its resistance will be high. Now, because its resistance is high, I know that this will be my V out. Yeah? And this would be, we could just call this V other. Now, I know that V out over V other is equal to R out over R1. And I'm just going to call this R1, and this one is obviously R out. Now what I'm saying is that as it gets colder, R out is going up. That means that V out must be going up as well. So I have a device where as, some, as it gets colder, the voltage it produces goes up. Why, why might that be important? Well, let's think about how an air conditioning or a fridge works or a heater works. Um, if I want to have a heater, um, then I could say that when the voltage out reaches a certain level, when it gets high enough, switch on my heater and warm up my house. What about if I wanted an air conditioning system? Well, what I could do is I could connect my air conditioner to V other. Because what will happen as it gets hot? As it gets hot, the resistance of the thermistor will drop, therefore V out will go down, but V other will go up. So if I measure here at V other, and have a device that magically measures that, then I could say when the V other gets to a certain level, switch on my air conditioning unit. Um, and there are all sorts of different circuits that we're going to play with in the class that will help you understand that a little bit more. Now, there's one last thing I want to talk about very quickly before we go, and that's how we could actually switch these things on. So let's say I have a heater. As I discussed earlier, we now know that when the temperature drops, this resistance, so I'm just going to call this R here, this resistor will increase and therefore the voltage between A and B, the voltage out, will go up. So how could I use that to switch something on? Well, the classic way is with a relay. This is the usual symbol that we use for a relay. And what a relay has is, oops, sorry, that's the symbol for heater, is a mag, is a switch that when a certain voltage goes through this switch, uh, or through this magnet, electromagnet, it closes a switch and turns on the rest of the circuit. So when the switch is open, no current can flow through the whole circuit. But when we get to enough voltage, it's going to close, and we'll find that happens. And we'll find that the heater switch is on. Okay. The other thing that you're going to come across are these ideas of diodes. Diodes are devices that only let current flow through them in one direction, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later.